Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. Exactly what that entails, we still don't know. You know, that's still what's kind of in churn and in formulation. But the diner itself will be restored, as Andrew points out at times, what era are we going to restore it to? You know, um, that isn't decided yet. There's a lot that still we don't know. But we just want, at each of these meetings, we'll give you an update on where things stand at the moment. Um, Andrew, anything you want to add to that? Uh, no, I think you covered it, Charlie. Thank you. Okay. Jeff, anything I totally forgot? 
wow, if it was not for Jeff, ladies and gentlemen, I'd be feeling like a monkey's uncle. <laughs> and thank you, Charlie, for filming this. Now, I would like to, I'm thrilled that so many people have come out. I'm thrilled with the amount of interest that the uh, diner is, is how, how invested people are in it. And with us tonight, one last pair, folks who uh, are interested in possibly being our operators. So, um, oh, I can't forget the names. Katie. Katie and River. And River. Um, so let's let's keep let's keep sending them. <laughs> so I'm going to pass this around. Toss in a dollar or two if you can, ladies and gentlemen. Kathy Bergman, I'm starting with you because I know your heart is. is oh, okay. <laughs> no, come on again. Anyway, without too much further ado, because I can't do a do. Um, I would like to, I would like to uh, say how thrilled I am uh, at tonight's presenter coming up here. Um, I first became aware of Richard, Richard Goodman uh, when in the 1970s. I was a teenager and I bought a book called Diners by a painter named John Bader. And John Bader did beautiful kind of photorealistic paintings of diners. And in diners, he talks a lot about America's foremost diner expert, Richard J.S. Boop. And when I joined Instagram a few years ago, I discovered that Mr. Boopman has a, his posts on Instagram, lots of cool old diners and neon signs and stuff that we love. Uh, and so I started following him on Instagram. When Jeff came to me with the idea of, uh, of community ownership of the diner, doing, doing something with the diner, I reached out to Mr. Goodman to say, you know, we need someone who knows something about diners, what do we do? And he very generously came on board early on. He's been an enthusiastic uh, supporter of, of what we're trying to do is, um, will be instrumental in the restoration of the diner structure itself. And one thing that he does know, inside and out, is diners. <laughs> and so, without further ado, why don't we welcome Mr. Richard Goodman to the stage. <laughs> the whole fourth on the American diner, it's past, it's present, and it's glowing future. Mr. Richard Goodman. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. Now let me tell you what really happened. <laughs> Actually, I met Charlie uh, on Instagram because I was an admirer of his work. And in August of uh, 2022, he said that he was interested in, he and some other people were interested in maybe doing something with the diner. And we had a little bit of a back and forth, and finally he uh, after a couple of exchanges, asked if I could recommend someone who might know something about how to restore a diner and what to do and uh, how to help them along. And I said immodestly, that would be me. <laughs> and uh, volunteered to come up to the first meeting that the group had in January. And actually, Charlie threw some money at me to come up to that meeting which was even nicer to sweeten the pot, but I had already agreed to come. And uh, I have joined the group uh, that is trying to revive this diner. So I've been involved in the diner world for uh, about 50 years. And I started uh, before that eating in diners when I was a youngster in Allentown, PA. There were 22 diners in the town where I grew up of 100,000 people, four within walking distance. So I had diners as part of my uh, daily life to a certain extent. I mean, obviously, I didn't go to them as much as I did when I started studying them. But uh, when I went to college, uh, I began to look at diners as the architectural 
icons that they uh, that they are, and discovered that no one had really done anything about the history of diners and how they came about. So I took that upon myself and ended up writing a number of books about it and working on uh, a number of restoration projects, over a hundred. And uh, we're going to look at a little bit of the history of diners, why, uh, how they evolved, the Worcester Lunch Car Company, which built 651 diners over their uh, life of 19, from 1906 to 1961. And then we'll also, with a few tangents thrown in, I would assume I'll go off on a few tangents, we'll also look at 10 projects where diners have been uh, threatened and they've been moved and revived and uh, generally speaking very successfully. <coughs> I first went to the Miss Bellows School. <laughs> Let's start off with this place. Yeah. Everybody knows it. The Miss Bellows Falls uh, came here in, during World War II from, uh, from Lowell. It was actually built for some other people and operated for a few years in Lowell. We're trying to figure out exactly what happened with that history. A lot of times when you go back 50, 60, 70 years, it gets very murky. And uh, I'm working on it. But this is what the diner looked like uh, not too long ago. No bushes out in front hiding it. Uh, this is a picture that was taken in 1975 by my colleague Elliot Kaufman, who uh, was the photographer who joined me in my first book that came out in 1979. And this is a happy family in a booth in the diner when it still had the uh, wall boxes on the booths, which evidently have walked away from the diner at some point over the years. Um, so this is uh, 75. The diner is really remarkably intact, happily. And uh, you'll see that some of the ones that I may show uh, are not like that. And that's one of the great things that, uh, that we have here in the place. Uh, Charlie Hunter has been beating the bushes not only for money but for information and he's found some old photographs of the diner or the previous diner actually uh, over on the left hand side in this slightly fuzzy picture beyond the gas station is the diner that was there before the present Miss Bellows Falls Diner. Generally, in many cases, the success of the place would lead the entrepreneur, the diner owner, to say, I can do better, I can do bigger, I need a bigger place, I can make more money, I can be more successful. And so, frequently, a smaller diner will be replaced by a newer one. And that is what happened here with this one. This is actually a picture of that first diner. And the curious thing for me is that it's practically the same size as the one that's there now. I had always assumed before Charlie turned up these pictures that the first diner probably was only one with a counter and stools and no tables or booths. But uh, here it is. Uh, it's got an interesting tile floor from the 1920s or so. The interior is a little different. It's been renovated uh, and doesn't have all of its original fixtures and furnishings to the hood and the ceiling and the back bar, but it's uh, pretty ancient and well-worn, and I think that that was why they brought in a newer diner that even in 1944, when it arrived, it was a used diner. But uh, this, is the, this is what we have now. Now, one of the things that I was able to do when I was uh, compiling the history of diners was find the, the, talk to the builders, the people that made these diners. And uh, I met with a man who made this drawing in 1975, uh, around 1975, 
74, 75. I was 25 years old. He was 90. His name was Charles Jem, and he was a French Canadian, and he was the superintendent, vice president, chief designer, and who knows what else at the Worcester Lunch Car Company, and he made the designs and specced all of the diners for their entire run uh, from 1906 to 1961. So what we have here is, uh, it says Frankie and Johnny's on the bottom because they originally, when it went to Lowell, it was for John Corsack and Willie Frank, who are the names that you see on the upper right. And uh, what is great about this diner, and completely unique in the world of diners, and I'm interested in this kind of information, obviously, is on the back of the diner uh, are the original panels that say Frankie and Johnny's. And I guess when it came to Miss Bella's Falls, they couldn't call it Frankie and Johnny's anymore, but being the miserly Yankees who bought these diners and kept them for 50, 60 years without ever doing anything, they said, well, why don't we just take those panels and, and put them on the back, and that way, you know, we'll have them for posterity. And so we'll show you a couple other pictures, uh, or one picture that shows that. Always poke around in the back of a diner. Under the diner, you know, in the cellar, if you can, if they'll let you go down there, because you never know what you can find. But he specified on this all of the different materials and the finishes for all of the things like the boots, the marble, the, the, the porcelain enamel. And that way we know what the thing looked like if you wanted to bring it back to exactly the way that was. Now, what Charlie said about what, what year are we going to make this, that's an interesting question because I was the director of a museum at Johnson & Wales University for 11 years and they had a 1926 diner that had been in nine locations and it was donated to the museum and we wanted to uh, restore it and the big question is what are we going to do with this? It's been renovated a million times and it has stainless steel over the wood of the ice box. It has formica over the wood of the ceiling and all these different things. So that's an essential question that we will have to tackle, wrestle with, and come up with. Uh, because we have historic preservation people who are, will be watching over us and making sure that we don't make any mistakes. So this is a picture of it that was taken by my friend John Margolis, who was a, uh, the late John Margolis, who was a chronicler of the roadside and got many uh, grants to travel all over the place and photograph uh, commercial buildings. And this is one that he took at that time. And of course, Charlie did mention that the sign, that little neon sign, has vanished. Uh, we don't know exactly where that is now, and I don't know whether we'll get that back, but we certainly know the neon people who can replicate that exactly, and that would be one of the things that we'll be doing. We'll be looking at the entrance vestibules on both sides because we want to do something that protects those four people that are sitting right next to the door when somebody opens it and it's January and your eggs freeze onto your plate. Uh, so those are, th this is a, what it looked like kind of in its heyday. Uh, this is a picture that I took in January, and so do you see that it has much, if you know exactly what you're looking at, like several people in the audience do, it's got the original oak booths, the, bar, the tables with the original very worn formica, Underneath some coverings are there. It's missing a few stools. Uh, it's got some broken little things on the costumers where you're, you would hang your hat. We need to deal with those. But it's got the original light fixtures uh, on the ceiling, not on the wall. The stained glass is all there. There might be one or two pieces that are missing. 
The beautiful marble, dark marble, is the original Tennessee marble that uh, Worcester used. The tile is nice on the floors. So it's really in remarkably good condition. Now, when I said that I was coming up here to uh, talk about uh, this, uh, uh, the diner in support of the project, I posted on a couple of times on my Instagram. And uh, among the several hundred people who jumped on the bandwagon were people who said, from Arizona, wish I could be there for your presentation. She's someone I went to high school with, so you know. <laughs> we'll just count that, that testimonial. A favorite of mine, looking forward to the restoration. I don't know who that person is. Rick and Marblehead is some guy who does a lot of architectural stuff. Uh, Adrian Bondo is a big uh, mid-century modern person in California who also wrote something nice. Um, good to know you've got a hand in it. I'm not sure who that is, but he's evidently a fan. So the point is, and, and there's another one that says, you know, one of my haunts when I was in college, that happily there's a community for these places, and people love this place. People who went here love it. But other people just look at a few pictures, and they say, oh yeah, 1941, Worcester Diner, I love it, kind of automatically. <laughs> And uh, those are the people that I think uh, are the ones that, that make up this, uh, this base of, uh, uh, that help us to kind of keep these things going. So we will now move into the history section. And briefly, you may ask, where did these diners come from? And if I showed you the child's book that said that the stork brought them, uh, that would be a complete phony story because this is an illustration from a famous trade magazine called The Diner, which came out from 1941 into the 1950s. And I acquired the world's largest collection of these magazines in 1972 upon the recommendation of one Tom Wolfe. I wrote to Tom Wolfe when I was a student, and I said, I just finished reading the Tangerine Colored Streamline, Tangerine Flake Street, one of his books <laughs> about, uh, about the, the race cars, the signs, and I said, yeah, I'm interested in our, our vernacular, popular culture environment. What should I do? And he said, look at trade magazines. So I discovered that there was a trade magazine called The Diner, and I acquired more than the Library of Congress had. And now they are in the, the uh, archives at the Henry Ford in Dearborn, Michigan, with the rest of my collection. Well, they started out as a food truck type operation pulled by a horse in 1872 in Providence, Rhode Island. And if anybody in this audience knows Casey's Diner in Natick, Massachusetts, which dates to 1922. Uh, the, the patriarch of that family worked in this wagon in the 1890s. And uh, Casey's is the oldest operating diner in the United States, 10 stools, and worth a visit. So they would be pulled out by horses after restaurants had closed for the evening, or like the food trucks of today, or the roach coaches, as they are not so affectionately known, uh, like the Cherry Palace, which was in Fishburg, this place went out to give some lunch or whatever to the people that were doing this uh, road work in Fishburg around the, uh, oh, maybe 1905 or 1906. So the first wagons, operated only at night for people on night shifts or people coming home from the theater or from bars or whatever. And then they decided that that was not a good business model because if you're operating a food service, why not be open during normal times when people eat, that is breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So they ended up moving off the streets 
and they specialized in hot dogs, sandwiches, and other things, and, and to advertise the dog, many of them had their own dogs as part of it, and they were called dog wagons uh, by some people because of the uh, propensity to, uh, to sell a lot of hot dogs. Now, I had five dogs over my career, one of which was at Cornell with me and got a Bachelor of Architecture uh, emeritus, I like to say, honorary, I guess, because of the time that he spent in the drafting room with me. Only stuck him into a few diners. But I will say that a couple of years ago, I found a picture of a small beagle in front of the state diner in, uh, in Ithaca, and I just reconnected with one of my classmates who had a, a couple of beagles, Eli and Annie. And I said, I sent this picture to Vic, and I said, is this your dog in front of the state diner? And he said, no, his dog went to another diner. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the first diner lunch car built by the Worcester Lunch Car Company in 1906. And it looks a little bit like the other wagons. It had two low wheels, because it wasn't negotiating the streets on a nightly basis. This was meant to be set up in a permanent location, though it was built on wheels. Uh, fabulously painted up by, by an artist who, uh, who did all the uh, wonderful uh, typography and the, the, the painted scroll work and the uh, old master style paintings. I mean, it's pretty incredible that they they, they did this for something that was just out in the weather that after about 10 years just got completely painted over and it was gone. Uh, they did have a menu though in flash glass on the window there. The, the last window on the right is what you could get. And that's sandwiches, pies, coffee, milk, and cigars. <laughs> because you need to polish off your meal in that way. And then next to that is a carriage window. So the other side with the door where you could get in would go up to the sidewalk if it were operating in the street. And this would be the drive-through where you would pull up in your horse-drawn vehicle and identified as a carriage window. Then it grew a little bit in, in length. So this one has one more window than that last one. But curiously enough, it also has a little handout window there on the left. So this is parked right in front of somebody's house. And part of the appeal of these little restaurants was you could put them anywhere on a, uh, on a little sliver of unused land, or you could take down your front porch and put the diner or lunch car right there and uh, use your own kitchen to do the baking or the roasts and uh, invite a few customers to come inside. So the interior of this looks like that. It's all wood at this point, 1910. Uh, even the floor is wood, although sometimes they had tile. But this is what Casey's Diner looks like. Uh, if you go there in Natick, it's got a wooden countertop, wooden uh, walls, counter apron, little spindly stools like that, and uh, they can accommodate ten, 10 people inside plus standing room only. But diners were built in factories. It's a prefabricated building, and this is what got me interested in them from the architecture uh, standpoint. I was in architecture school and uh, it was a time when our classes and our student life was interrupted by things that were going on in 1968 and 69, specifically guns on campus at Cornell and Columbia and other places. So uh, I, for whatever reason, under the influence of some British design critics, took a close look at the diner as a unique prefabricated building and discovered it was undiscovered 
in terms of the scholarship and thought, well, maybe I'll look into this. And that was in 1970. So they would then wheel them out on wheels on a trailer to a location. And uh, this is uh, the, the outfit that moved all the Worcester lunch cars. And the man driving that truck named Arthur Lafleur had a son named Henry Lafleur, who I got this picture from, and a bunch of others. Handsome Harry was the name that he went by in his professional wrestling career. <laughs> he was also a diner mover and a masseuse who worked at the Bancroft School of Massage. A very eclectic and interesting person. And when we went to his house in 1974 and for 50 bucks bought a whole lot of stuff, it was priceless. When we went down into the basement, and saw all the wrestling pictures. I'm hitting myself saying, why didn't I at least get a few pictures of Handsome Harry on the mat to show the other side of his, uh, his strange life. But they moved all the diners. So they started to build bigger diners because, you know, a 10 stool place uh, can be mobbed at breakfast, lunch, and dinner if you're doing well. So the Chadwick Square was originally in Chadwick Square in Worcester. Uh, there was some urban development there, and it moved out to Cherry Valley, which was uh, west of Worcester on the Route 9. Uh, in uh, 1956, it moved out from downtown. I actually am going to look at my notes here, because I really can't remember every specific of all of this, and I know you want to know exactly <laughs> when this happened. So, so I moved out to Cherry Valley, which is where I took this picture with John Bader along with me. He did a nice painting of this. And then this property was threatened, and in 1979, it moved back. Oh, well, this is through the window. Pardon me, jump ahead. This is through the window. So this is a beautiful... Look at the incredible tile floor there. Wonderful tile work on the counter. Uh, mahog gumwood exterior. Marble top tables uh, along the wall there. Four tops. Uh, and this is a picture that we uh, that was on the cover of the Boston Globe magazine in 1976 with the title "Meatloaf Every Day." And this is <laughs> one of my first articles. But in 79, then it moved down into uh, Worcester itself. It was parked up against a, a mill building that was a uh, mu live music club. And, it, and it's been there since 1979 and is still going strong. So we've lost a lot of diners. But we're going to celebrate some of the ones that uh, are, are still going or brought back from the dead, like what we're going to do here. The Boulevard Diner is another example of one. This is from 1936, and this has been operating on Shrewsbury Boulevard. Boulevard Diner, period. You can see in the portrait of that. And uh, this has been there on this location since 1936. Uh, Wonderfully ringed with neon, got the clock, says, you know, time to eat. And uh, telephone booths, unfortunately, no longer there. Who needs them? But uh, a great place. There's another diner directly across the street from them that also serves the same kind of Italian fare. But the diner across the street from them has this stucco facade, and it's got dining rooms and other things built onto it. And for 30 years, I never went inside the place because I was so put off by this ridiculous exterior. I went in, it was like a perfect 1920s diner. So the moral of that story is, you know, if you cover it up, uncover it, because uh, people got to know what you got. Then they built bigger diners and bigger diners. This is a 
20 stein and it's 60 feet long, which is basically about twice the size of the Miss Bellows Falls. This was on Old Colony Boulevard in Dorchester, zoned by the Georginus family, who uh, were some Greeks that got into the diner business in the 1930s in Boston. They eventually had a chain of eight diners around Boston. This one moved up to Drake it, and unfortunately is now the uh, kitchen and storage area for a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> and we don't know what, where those beautiful panels are, and we don't know what happened to the interior, because generally speaking, people that run Chinese restaurants are not interested in letting guys like me come in and say, can I look in your kitchen? <laughs> maybe, maybe sometimes. Uh, this is another gigantic Worcester diner that was built for uh, a, an owner-operator named Jimmy Evans in Salisbury, Massachusetts. And this diner, at the end, has a dining room that is uh, uh, differentiated from the rest of the diner by some pocket doors that are in that mahogany wall and has four uh, booths for six people each, so you can have your birthday parties and other things in there. And it's got a, it's a wonderfully great condition on the inside. It said Ann's Diner, but when Pat bought the diner from Ann, she decided to take off the porcelain enamel. And the porcelain enamel does exist somewhere, and we're hoping that somebody, uh, it doesn't have to be named Ann, could, uh, could uh, get Ann's Diner back in business. So when I was out photographing all of this uh, stuff in the 1970s and really talking to people to get the history down, talking to the manufacturers and, and observing, look at, by close looking, figuring out you know, how things changed, who built what, we were kind of literally beating the bushes. That is me. That is Kelly, who's sitting right here in this polka dot shirt. This this dog right here. This oh, this happens when you get too close to me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that dog is the dog from Cornell, uh, and he was he loved to root around under diners and would might alert me to. Hey, there's an old broken jukebox secret <laughs> around the back. He could sniff it out. <laughs> so this is on Route 20 in Shrewsbury. This diner was later moved to a campground, but there are three other diners uh, within a few miles of this spot on Route 20, which I will now tell you about as part of the this uh, uh, part of the this is the diners have been saved. Feature. So this was down the road, Uncle Will's Diner, not built by the Worcester Ranch Road Company, big stainless steel diner built in New Jersey, was lying fallow at that time on Route 20, uh, in Shrewsbury also, and it was purchased by a guy that I worked with for a number of years in 1989, and he sold it to a person from Montreal who had some pizza restaurants, and he ended up moving it to Montreal, taking the whole thing apart. He fell through the floor in the walk-in. It was so rotten. So he completely rebuilt it into, uh, in two pieces, and then dropped it onto his location in Montreal uh, after about a two-year uh, restoration project. This is one of my favorite pictures of this because these are a couple of guys that are sitting in the dining room area kind of waiting for somebody to bring them some food. <laughs> There's not even a table there yet. But uh, they would bring the front half of the diner in and the front half would have the counter, stools, maybe some booths, and the back would have a little area maybe for some extra tables, then the kitchen, then some restrooms, 
and uh, an office walk-in and some other things. So diners started to get a little bit bigger at that time. Uh, this is what they would have looked like on the inside. He uh, completely uh, re rebuilt it to the specifications of the original uh, 1952. It had an open kitchen, which was very interesting for this diner. And uh, great uniforms and uh, the, whole, the whole package. And this is a diner. This is two diners, one from 1932 and one from 1935, that at this time were not looking real, uh, real healthy, also in Shrewsbury. And uh, this property was developed, and these two diners were split apart and sold separately. And when this started, the Midway Diner, the one on the left, was a regular diner. They were doing a great business and they brought in another one that had, had a fire. It matched it, and Worcester made it into a dining room only. It was kind of a gutted thing, and I think that one thing that we might do here with the Miss Bellows Falls, if there's interest in adding on to that for some extra seats, we might be able to find another old half a diner somewhere and add some authentic seating onto it. So a man named Neil Todd bought the, the this one half of the diner, I mean Doug Johnson bought the other half, and uh, this was in uh, 1981. So Neil Todd restored the diner, we visited then. Something happened to him, he lost interest, he got sick. He sold it to a guy named Don Levy, who was a diner entrepreneur in Boston, who's had a bunch of diners. And Don Levy sold it to a man named David Clem, who was one of your neighbors uh, in, uh, in Vermont, who was developing various properties here, there, and everywhere. And uh, David took it to uh, one Kendall Square, where he was working on a small project. And the idea was to uh, maybe uh, have it in operation there, and he parked it in front of the parking garage there. Alas, it never opened there, and the next thing I knew, I went down to take some more pictures and it wasn't there anymore. So he uh, ended up taking it to his place up near here and uh, fixing it up very nicely. As you can see, here's the interior of it. And uh, he moved it to Norwich in 1994. And uh, then in 1997, he moved to Hanover and moved it there. It was in uh, some snow at one point when we went up and saw it, looking very sweet and uh, cozy. And then it was later spotted along with its sister diner in West Lebanon, and uh, there was talk of it being used in one of his development projects there. Now, interestingly enough, the one in the back is the first one that David bought. Uh, about a, two years ago, I met a woman who is an art teacher at Simmons because she did an art project in Colorado that I was asked to come out and give a diner talk at. And after I got back from Colorado and I met her, she said, come up to dinner at my house. I went to dinner at her house in North Andover, and she said, you know, when we bought this house, there was a diner in the yard. And I said, oh, I know what diner that was. <laughs> that was Doug Johnson's diner. And uh, eventually, she, stayed, she said, here, look at this picture of this diner at our house. And then eventually David bought that diner. And uh, who knows what's going to happen to him. But we know with him, they're in safe hands. Because he knows what to do with diners. He finds the right home. Okay, another diner down the street from, from the Midway uh, and Mindy's and Uncle Will's was the Edgemere Diner. This was originally in Boston. It's one of the Englewood Diners. Moved out to Shrewsbury in the 1950s. Underwent a lot of uh, ownership changes and was auctioned off in December of uh, 2021. And then uh, it was moved off-site. It was purchased 
for $45,000 by a man named Mike Jofi, who has a hipster diner out in the Catskills. And he, uh, his hipster diner is really great food, but not a very good diner from my, from my uh, perspective. 1960, I don't know. It's not the, uh, not the right look, so he wanted a really cool 1940s diner. Unfortunately, the thing is still sitting in storage, but he's going to move it out to the Catskills and give it another life. And if it hadn't been for the woman who was bidding against him, who wanted a folly for her backyard, he would have gotten it for $20,000 less. <laughs> because she just, you know, had some money and thought maybe she should get a diner. That was an interesting auction. Okay, well here's another one that we will look at. This is Lloyd's Diner, the last diner built by the Worcester Lunch Bar Company in the late 50s. You can see that these diners are not looking like those old barrel roof or monitor roof diners. They were finally bigger, they were using more stainless steel, different kind of enamel to compete with a certain extent with those flashy diners from New Jersey. And this operated in Rhode Island, it was bought by another friend of mine who uh, was saving diners. And he ended up selling it to Alexis Stewart, who happens to be the daughter of a person named Martha Stewart. And she moved it down to Bridgehampton on Long Island, and the New York Times wrote a little article that said, Bridge Hampton says no to tacky diner. <laughs> they wouldn't let her put it in there. She sold it, and it's been up in Meredith, New Hampshire now since uh, 1991. And it's uh, a great site for, uh, for car shows, which is also uh, a magnet. The diner is a magnet for that. Now, the, in Newport, New Hampshire, you may remember the Streamliner, which operated there. It was bought, this is a 1939 diner, bought by the same guy that was rescuing others, John Keith, uh, who bought the one before. He bought it in 1991. And he sold this to an auction house in Atlanta that had bought a, another diner and they sold both of them to the Savannah College of Art and Design, which is a place that has restored many buildings in Savannah. And both of these two diners have been operating since the early 90s as successful restaurants in Savannah. This is what it looks like down there. This is the Forest Diner that was under 20 in, uh, in Auburn, also near there. And this one was, uh, became Libby's Blue Line Diner up in Colchester. This is another late Worcester, and you can see the interior of it shows uh, a different type of roof design, a ceiling design, and uh, a little bit modern, but still Worcester always mixed in with their marble and formica and ceramic tile. There was always wood in a Worcester diner. Gives it that kind of uh, hominess that most people wanted. And then it was moved up to, uh, to Colchester by a woman named Karen Griffin. And she put these kind of uh, additions onto the side, put a hat on top of it. And the inside is very authentic, but it's pretty well camouflaged, if you ask me. And in 2012, it was uh, bought by some Greek people and is now known as the Athens Diner. And uh, still is uh, very vintage on the inside. Well, this is one of my favorite projects. In 1984, this 1946 Worcester Diner was uh, bought for $5,000 by Henry Ford Museum and uh, upon my recommendation and uh, was moved out there 850 miles to Dearborn and became uh, over a three year restoration period part of the centerpiece of an, uh, 
of an exhibition called The Automobile in American Life. So O.B. Hill, a rigger and mover in Natick, uh, this is the first time they moved a diner and they moved so many diners. They, they came to a lecture of mine in Natick uh, last year and Brian and his driver were sitting in the back and somebody said they heard him say, we moved that diner. We moved that diner. We moved that diner. We moved that diner three times. Uh, so they know how to move diners. 850 miles. It was uh, trucked inside the museum after being worked on for a while outside the museum and underwent a uh, quite a long restoration. And uh, was the, the name of the original owner, Clovis Lamy, was put on it. He came out to the uh, museum and sat down in the empty diner with his wife, and he could remember every single item that was on the menu board, and then gave us recipes for some of the things, which are now being used in an updated fashion, because after, well, they have as many as 1.8 million visitors a year, and the feeling by food service for a long time was 39 seats, a million visitors, I don't think so. But finally, they got some people in there that said, we gotta, we gotta serve some food in that place. So uh, around 2016, I was asked to come out and uh, talk to them about diner food. And I will say that one of the things, they have a great, wall boxes there from the 1940s and uh, Kelly's father who had a band, a big band in the 1940s put together a wonderful tape of all authentic 1946 music which they played for a while in the diner but uh, somehow somebody said, yeah 1946 music, I don't think so <laughs> so that's not there anymore but they got great food there Prices are not 1946, but it's <laughs> worth it, what you get. And then there's this diner, which is the same style, which was called Squeak's Diner. It was in, uh, in Connecticut for a long time, 1941, same year as the Miss Bellows Falls. Uh, got stripped down after it was brought to Pawtucket, Rhode Island in uh, 2011 and underwent a nine-year restoration because it was kind of a low priority for the guy who owned it, who was a lawyer and developer who owned a gigantic mill building complex. And uh, this is what it looked like after they finished. And uh, the food is fantastic. It opened up on January 20th, 2020. So you know what happened about seven weeks after that. It closed down and has reopened and is uh, doing well again. But uh, it's really beautiful. And it was uh, originally called Donwell's Diner when uh, Stanley Zawissa had it. His nickname was Squeak. And so it was called Squeak's Diner for a long time. And uh, it's now at uh, a complex uh, where there's a uh, uh, Lorraine fabrics and some other things. So that person called it the Miss Lorraine. And the Miss Portland is another one that would, uh, was given to the city of Portland in, uh, in 2004 after the owner had an essay contest where he was going to give it away. He got a thousand entries but he didn't give it to anybody. I don't understand exactly what happened. Put it on eBay, no one bought it. Then he gave it to the city, and they put out an RFP, and it was purchased by a man named Tom Manning, who was a Mainer, who came up back to Maine from New York City, restored the diner in uh, 2000, over a few years, and it's been going very nicely in Portland, moved it a half a mile down the road. Uh, the interior, very authentic, completely original, and he also added a dining room and doubled the size of it, 
and it's kind of a little bit of a nondescript dining room, but he did replicate the Worcester style booths in it. And another success story. The last one that I'll show here is another one from uh, the World War II period, pretty much the same size as the Miss Worcester. This was Witt's Diner out in Orange, bought by a man named Richard Lloyd, who wanted his name put on it. And he hired me to uh, design a new facade. And somehow, also Tom Sawyer, Kelly, and me into helping him hang those porcelain enamel panels <laughs> in the very nice working conditions, as you can see. And uh, we helped them. We did 68 pieces of enamel and uh, window trim and corner pieces. And then uh, O.B. Hill moved that to their location in, uh, in Framingham, where we photographed it uh, not too long ago. And this was brought in in uh, 1990. So still going strong, uh, 30, almost 35 years later. You get a lot of poached eggs there, and as if I needed more bacon, the people who I was with said, how about a side of bacon along with the bacon? And it's like, you know, enough bacon for 20 people. Uh, but a beautiful marble top table. And uh, so I think that we can do something really great here with the Miss Bellows Falls. This is what it looked like when we were up here in January. It's got, as I said before, the great enamel, the original stools, wonderful tile work. It's got those booths that we were just looking at. Uh, we do we will need to find three original stools of them somewhere. And the back, part of Johnny's, from Frankie and Johnny's. So maybe we'll be able to incorporate them one way or another. So a number of years ago, a guy cartoonist named Bill Griffith uh, started doing a lot of cartoon comic strips that had a lot of roadside stuff in it. And when he did, he did a lot of things about diners, and I sent him some pictures, and he used some of them in his strip. And when he did this one, I thought maybe he was really talking directly to me. <laughs> And so was this guy. <laughs> so this guy was in Lloyd's Diner when I was, he was not looking at my poached eggs, he was looking at me. And I had a close-up of him that Kelly said was way too scary to use. I should use this one. <laughs> but, you know, there are other people who sometimes when you're in a diner and you're not eating, you're taking pictures, they, 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 they don't say it. They mean it. Like, what are you doing? And I don't wear a clown costume. <laughs> and people may think I'm a clown because, in fact, I like to look at diners. And I will climb up on them and, you know, uh, take a picture through the window. I, she could have taken a picture like this of me today at the Chelsea Royal when I was trying to look inside that place. But uh, occasionally, you know, I'll turn around for the camera like I did here in 1988, right before I was uh, filmed for a CBS This Morning show. And uh, what can I say? I like diners. <laughs> That's it. Try to answer a question if anybody has one. I noticed that the diner style went from wagon to something that looked like a railroad car. Right. Yes. When and why? Okay. That was done so that people for the next hundred years could think that diners were old railroad cars. <laughs> and this is something, I mean, it's incredible. And we went to a diner today for lunch in Gardner, and you and Kelly looked it up in the little description blurb it said it's a train car. Well, it was built by the Worcester Lunch Car Company. What happened was they were built in factories, so as they got bigger, they needed to stay narrow. And they continued to adopt this look 
of a vehicle look because they were on wheels uh, and they were moved on wheels. So in order to, to kind of uh, keep those proportions, they ended up copying and uh, synthesizing designs that they would see on a railroad car, maybe a railroad dining car, but a completely separate industry where you had 20, 30, 40 companies that built these places as restaurants. And when they started to get bigger and be built in multiple sections, they couldn't keep that, that imagery going. And that's when things started to get a little bit haywire and they started to build diners that didn't look like diners anymore. Yes? Do you think that diner will have to be taken off site to be renovated? Well, Andrew? <laughs> Yes. Do we think that's going to make the most sense and we're thinking about different possible places in the area where it could be taken to be restored, ideally a conditioned space, uh, but we haven't, we haven't gotten so far as to make a specific plan about that. The yeah. site is very tight, as you probably know, and so to think about sort of doing the demolition and the site work and whatever additional work is going to be needed on site with the diner right there just doesn't, it's possible, but it doesn't really seem smart to me, so I think we're going to Try to find another place that's protected where the work, the restoration work can happen and then move it back. Yeah, so there are many, I mean, as different as all of these places are, the approaches that people take when they're, after they've acquired one and they're reinventing it or restoring it, uh, you can do anything. But I think to have it in it undercover or in a different location and not be impeded by other stuff that might be going on, because they might be able to build the foundation, put the kitchen, restrooms, and other things in, and then slip the diner in and start cooking. Yes? I have a bunch of questions, so I might need to talk to you after, but the tumble in diner in Clermont, how hard is it to move these things? Like they, I was told by the uh, Alice Mescouris, he said he knew you. Alice Mescouris, yes. Yeah. So he said that it was too, it was too difficult to move it, and I'm just wondering if that's. He's moved a number of diners. That fellow who said it's too difficult to move it. We're talking about okay. So in Claremont is the Tumble In Diner, a fabulous 1940s Worcester diner. Well, but it's a particular design. They only built one diner that ever looked like this. Really interesting, a streamlined diner, but not with slanted sides. It's got stained colored stained glass, fabulous tile, porcelain enamel exterior with lettering like no other diner has. And the the people that owned it went through some incredible reversals of people dying and all sorts of horrible health issues. And so the diner had to be sold. And it has evidently been purchased by someone from Queens, New York, who owns four or five other diners. And uh, I think they're going to leave it there and fix it up, but I don't really know. So yeah. you can well, move it. I own the building. <laughs> well, come up here and tell us about it. <laughs> and I really was hoping to have that diner moved Moved inside your building. Because it would fit. Well, then, we moved one inside the building. No, actually, I worked on a project in San Diego where they built a diner inside a building, a historic building. And I was contacted by some architects who originally said, I have a client who's got a historic hotel, and then one of the restaurants they want to do inside this hotel, they want to move a diner inside. And they didn't. They ended up not doing it because it was too problematic. Because they didn't have the space. But there's a Harley Davidson dealership in uh, outside of Cleveland that has a diner that moved from New Hampshire to their inside their building. Uh, there, you could do it. Okay. Let's talk about it, <laughs> David. 
depending on when that was built, I think you may find there's a steel lining structure underneath it. Now, depending on the, the era that it was built, if it's a Western log structure, there will be steel lining. Yeah. And there will be a stiffening rod to hold those together. They were always canted. So originally it should be restored to the way it was when it first came here in 1944, which is unchanged really from when it was built in 1941. I mean, that's what we did at the, at the Henry Ford. We have some Henry Ford people here who've climbed all the way from Dearborn to visit us here tonight. Uh, no, they wanted to... At the, the, that Lamy's Diner had been altered a number of times. In 1950, they'd taken out the hood, they changed the stools, they took the name off of it, and the idea was to make it look like it came out of the factory in 1946. And I think that that's, there's a tremendous uh, pull to do that when you have most of the things there. I mean, it doesn't make it. This diner was never really changed. So, I mean, you could put in, you could do food from different eras, like 2025 food uh, for now, so that people get the food that they want to eat, but they're in a place that is unlike any other, and it's just got that kind of. Uh, innate sensibility that makes you feel so good when you're in a diner. One quick follow-up. Yeah. As you know, the steam table uh, is in the cellar. Right. Um, the, the bushes who ran the diner in the 70s and 80s say, boy, that thing works great. Do um, you think that should be a part of the... Do I think the steam table should be part of it? Well, <laughs> yes, I do, but you got to talk to your food service operators and are they going to make things that would be appropriate to be holding in a steam table? I mean, yeah, they, they could have, there's a thing for roasts, they could have stews and uh, chilies and other things in there. I think that generally speaking, when you think about steam table, you think of like green beans that have been in there for a few hours. And that you don't necessarily want to do. Because that's not always the case. I mean, that's sort of a bad expectation. But I think you can outfit that back bar. I mean, we know exactly what was in there. But you also have to um, make it workable for whoever's going to take it. Now, there were diners in the 30s and 40s where they would come into Charlie Jim and say, I want a soda fountain. You know, I don't need ice cream freezers here. And there would be a place for the multi-mixers, or there would be things to dip into in the back. And that way, you can come in and sit at the counter and watch somebody make you a banana split, or, you know, pull the, pull the milkshake off. And that's another part of the appeal of sitting there. So, you're going to have a kitchen in the back, where you're going to be able to prepare other things that are not short order, and maybe you don't want a flat top with this bacon splattering all over the place. I mean, there's all the different kind of things and directions to go into, and uh, yeah, get a few more diners and line them up and <laughs> do a bunch of approaches. One, another question here? Yeah, so there's the question of when you restore it to. Yes. But then there's the other question of for whom are you restoring it? Right. And so that's the question I'm interested in as well. Uh -huh. Here in Bells Falls, Rockingham. Yeah, for whom are we restoring this? Well, I think you're restoring the diner for the community here. For the people who know that this thing has been a part of your landscape since World War II. And some people have gone in it, some people haven't gone in it. I think if you make that into a, wow, look at how great that place is, with that neon sign and another sign that says open, the word of mouth, when you have great food service operators that are doing great things that people want to eat, you're going to have people going there 
Who? Because they want that experience. And then you're going to have the 285 people that are going to say, oh, look what Gutman posted today. <laughs> we got to go back to the Miss Bellas Falls and Yankee Magazine, you know. They'll be back here. For a number of times, Yankee Magazine came to me to, to say, you know, what are the best, tell them what were the best diners in New England. So I did it a few times. And last time that I did it, they it did the intro and they said, nobody knows more about diners than Richard Gutman. And then the next time they did it, they called some other joker. <laughs> I was about to write to him. I said, what, this guy's better at Google than I am? <laughs> they were terrible decisions. So anyway, I think that the point is, is that these things, you know, people like these things. They've been on the TV programs. I was on Chronicle News Magazine in Boston five times. But the fifth time I called up my sister, I said, guess what, I'm going to be on Chronicle again. And instead of saying, great, she said, can't they find somebody else? <laughs> <laughs> is that the same thing over again? And I said, no, this is a story that never gets old. It gets reinvented, and when you bring these places back, people are happy. I like to look at diners. I like to eat in them. Yes. Um, at, we're not from here, um, but we're really interested in diners. And so what I'm wondering is if the Historical Society or this initiative is cataloging and getting oral histories from peoples and their memories. Because again, when you look at what the long-term um, opportunities are for education and talking about you know, putting it in the context of American architecture and roadside architecture, even in um, school curriculums and things, um, Having those kind of stories can be very helpful in the long run. Well, that is a wonderful, actually, it's a wonderful summation for uh, the lead into the next uh, program, <laughs> which will be November 9th uh, and being compiled by Mr. Charlie Jarris, who owned the diner from in the 90s and 2000s, into 2000s, and it is called Tales from the Diner. Right. And it's people who worked at the diner and people who own the diner. Uh, and indeed, we're, we have, we're not formally yet doing oral histories, but I, I think it, that, is, that is a component that is very important. And we should, we should actually try to work up a great, she's involved in the historical society. We, I didn't say you should, I said we should work up a grant. That's the legendary Kathy Bergen, ladies and gentlemen. You don't want to cross her. <laughs> like you just did. <laughs> anyway, I think, I think that's a great uh, place to leave this. I'm sure Richard will be happy to talk about diners more. Thank you all so much for coming out, and together we're going to do this. <laughs>